I was mad with myself because I had allowed someone else to come into a relationship that I had built with my father and to tear it apart. And I didn't get a chance to call him anymore. I couldn't see him anymore. I couldn't work on building it. I literally had just got this relationship with him and I allowed someone else on the outside to intervene and to tear it apart. So when he died, I was tore up. Um, my mom was still connected to him. That's another story for another day. But um, I, I, I was, I was distraught and I didn't know what else to do. Didn't know what to do. I just started not, not doing well. And then we went, then my grandma, so, in this time, like of me losing my father, a lot of good was happening as well. Uh, mind you, when I moved to Indiana in 2012, I met my now husband that I'm with, and um, we uh, were just enjoying life and really being able to have fun with the people, the pe person I was in a relationship with, really enjoying each other. And we were engaged to be married at this point. Um, our wedding was um, in April. So we got married that April. We had our ceremony in May. And I wanted nothing more than my, my father to be there. My stepdad was there with my mom and I appreciate them. But I wanted nothing more than my father to be there to really witness um, me marrying the man I was supposed to marry. <laughs> he witnessed the very first one and this is what what's so hard when I got married the first time. Um, he was there for me and he witnessed it and walked me down the aisle like, you know, a girl's dream. Daddy walked you down the aisle. Um, so he was there for me and was able to be a part of that for me. And that was uh, such a beautiful thing. But um, he wasn't there for this one. And it, and it broke my heart that I, didn't, I couldn't share that with him. But one thing I did was watch and see and know that God kept me is he allowed my grandma to be there. Because mind you, my grandma passed away in, Oct in um, October 2014. So she was there with me to be able to experience it. And let me tell you how sweet my grandmother is. And literally her name was Sweet, uh, Grandma Sweet, um, or they would call her Sweet. Um, my cousin's Aunt Sweet or something along them lines. And um, she knew she was sick but she wouldn't tell me about it. Sorry, y'all. I'm trying to make this so emotional. I promise y'all I'm not. But she didn't tell me about it until after my ceremony. Oh, it wasn't, we didn't do a ceremony. It was like a um, reception. That's what we did. So we had our wedding at the church. We had witnesses there. Um, and then we, a month later, had our reception. And she was there. She was so proud. So she was just watching with cheer in her face. And the whole time she was dying. But she cared enough to be there for me. And um, I appreciated that so much. That spoke so much to my heart. Sorry, y'all. Sorry. I'm trying not to. Y'all, come on. Come on. Hey, you got this, girl. She was there for me. Um, and I want to say maybe a couple weeks later is when she revealed the news to me. I think it may have been a week later. She revealed the news to me that she was dying. And um, over the next few months, I had to process the fact that she was dying. So I got a call in February that my father... suddenly died then in May oh mind you I graduated from college got my master's degree in um what was that May I got that in May so let's go back I my father passed away in February I get I get married in April I graduate grad school in May my I I married, I had my reception with my husband at the end of May, like a, I think a week later we had the reception. And then in October, my grandma dies. No, in September, my uncle dies, so I come back to Alabama. Then in October, my grandma dies. 
So I'm at this point with this roller coaster of emotions, trying to figure out how to live life, trying to how to go figure out how to go about doing different things with them both being gone. Well, then all three of them being gone because they all were pivotal people in my life and trying to figure out how to just continue to live without them. So I went through a season of loss and depression for the next, let's see, four, yeah, right at four years. Because it was 2018 when I finally had to come to a point of releasing my mom and then getting therapy to help or counseling because I don't remember going to a therapist per se, but I did go to a counselor. Getting counseling to help me understand where I was and what was causing me to be where I was and what was helping me. I mean, what was hindering me from being able to recover. So um, dealing with grief is never easy. It's never easy. And people say, oh, um, you'll get better over time. And you, 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 you feel better. Um, but depending on the grief and how it took place and how it came about, it's harder to um, completely recover. So it took about four years before I was in the process or in the head space to want to recover. So when I finally got to a point of wanting to recover and being ready to recover, I um, it was four years later. My husband didn't know. He saw a glimpse of what was going on, but he didn't know how far torn down I was. In 2018, my body started to fall apart. I started having pains and ailments and things messing with me that I didn't even know where they came from. They just out of nowhere came and the Lord sat me down. He sat me down. He said, listen, child, if you don't get somewhere and sit down, you're going to kill yourself. So I had to listen. Um, I believe within this time I had um, lost a good friend of mine. One of my daughter's friend, moms passed away within this window as well. And she was very young in her 30s, early 30s, I think 33 um, she had passed away from, I believe it was an aneurysm. And within her passing away, um, and also, you know, it made me really re refocus and rethink because this was the only person in my friend group that ever saw me, saw me. Um, she wasn't, not friend group, but just in the, the group of people that I was around during this time that really saw me. And she really took the took time out to, to make sure she we talked when I was around, not just shun me or anything like that. So that one was really painful as well. Um, but I'm saying this to say that, like, if you're dealing with grief, it's okay to acknowledge the feelings and it's okay to process what's going on. But as you go through this process, don't allow yourself to be lost with them. They don't want you to die with them, too. They want you to live. God still has you here, so he wants you to live. So if it's getting therapy, get it. Don't let the stigma of therapy stop you from getting therapy or counseling. If it's something that's going to help you talk about all the things that are going on in your world and help you to become a better you or a recover you or a healthier you, then do what you need to do to make your life better. God wants us to treat his temple right. So I'm... I'm I'm working on this part, but the fifth, the rest of me, um, it's a work in progress as well because um, I emotionally eat a lot. And because I emotionally eat a lot, um, I, I um, cause myself the yo-yo of weight. Um, I'm in the middle of a fast as we speak right now, trying to reset and reconnect with what I know I need to do for myself. Um, but because I eat my emotions instead of acknowledging them, I run into situations where I cause unhealthy things to take place in my life. So I'm saying that to say, even with grief, we've got to make sure that we're taking care of our temples, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, all of that, because that's what God wants us to do. So if it's getting therapy, get therapy. Definitely increase your prayer life. Gain a relationship with God. Don't just pray, but build a relationship with him. Because in order for you to be able to completely recover or to go through the healing process, you're not going to be able to do it alone. You're going to need that support group with you. And God's your first support. Therapy and counselors are going to be second. And then good, positive, supporting family is going to be third. So definitely um, surround yourself with people and um, things that 
will help you to um, heal from what's happened in your life. Grief is never easy for anybody. I can tell you that now. Um, but it's a process. And there are a lot of emotions that go along with grief. You get anger. You get frustration. You get disappointment. You get sadness. You get depression. You get anxiety. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of emotions come along with grief. So it's acknowledging those emotions and allowing yourself to have those emotions. Never let anybody tell you, oh, stop crying. They died 10 years ago. No, they don't know the connection you have that person and some trigger or memory may come up that makes you think about that person and it makes you sad that you no longer get to experience that, that moment with them. But the goal is to be able to, like I said in the beginning, is to keep living, keep going and living life that they would have wanted you to live. Make them proud that you're still going and you're still doing things that you and them may have talked about you wanted to do and that you're continuously to live life and continue to grow and prosper in all areas of life because that's your focus. If you're not there, then start. Start to recover, start to heal, start to let go of the things that are holding you down because you're grieving someone that you lost. We know that they'll never be back, but you can always keep them here in your heart and always here, the memories in your mind. And those those memories and those um, times that you guys have had with each other are going to be the ones that are going to keep you, keep you going, keep you motivated because you're going to want to say to them, look, I'm doing this. I wish you were here to see it, but I know you know that I'm doing this. Because um, I talk to my grandma all the time and tell her that. And she sees me, and I know she does, and she's happy. Thank you, grandma. Um, and I talk to my daddy, and I know that he's proud of the things that I'm doing. And my uncle, um, they, they're all knowing that I'm doing good, and I'm, I'm, re I'm recovering, and I'm healing from losing them. So thank you guys always for watching over me. Um, <clears throat> But for those of you that are dealing with grief and don't know, like, where to begin or how to start, I say start start with prayer first. If you're not connected with the church, find a church home. And then <clears throat> reach out to your doctor and tell them about the feelings you're feeling because then they'll connect you with a therapist. And if it's something you need for chemical imbalance, then I'm not against medicine. If medicine is what's going to help you, allow it to help you, but don't allow it to be your crutch. Don't allow medicine to be the thing that you lean into more than you lean into God. Then you lean into talking about what's going on within you. But if it's something that's going to help you, then get what you need to help you. But then focus on rebuilding and healing and being able to be able to be independent and be able to do this without the support and help of everybody else. The goal is to have them as you need them, but then to be able to branch off and do this process on your own. I can't keep talking about grief, y'all. <laughs> grief is hard. My life has not all had not been a fully sad story, y'all. I promise it hasn't. Um, but there's a lot that's been going on in it, and um, I know I'm not the only one dealing with it. So I'm sharing my story, my story, my story, my story, and I want you guys to all know that you know life has its bumps in the road, and it's up to us to react to them the way we should to make a difference for our lives, if that makes sense. So just because we go through bumps in the road doesn't mean we have to fall down and stay down. That means we pick ourselves back up, we brush ourselves off, and we keep going. That's what that means. Life does not mean keep standing in the dumps and feeling like, oh, woe is me. I, I just uh, throw yourself a pity party. No, 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 no pity parties. No. Um, life wants you to get up and keep going. Um, you got to keep moving. You got to keep doing the things you need to do to make life better for yourself. If you're not happy with where you are, then you change that. You stand in control of that. All right. So the next chapter in the book talks about pain. Um, and just understanding that everybody goes through pain. So I talk about um, kind of along the lines of some of the stuff I said with grief and getting the help we need. But I talk about um, understanding like the pain that my mom went through in life and the things that she experienced in what 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 happened was it was a trickle down effect. The things she went through, she took them out on us. Um, 
henceforth a lot of the abuse we went through. That trickle down effect came. And then lo and behold, the same thing comes and tries to resonate in me as I'm having kids because I'm a young mom trying to figure it out. And then I'm so strict on my kids and, you know, I feel like I'm just not being the parent I need to be. So I had to come to the realization that, whoa, you are becoming your mother. And if you keep going in the way you're going, then you're going to abuse your kids. And I couldn't let that be because I know how I felt being done that way. Now, my kids, they got spankings and stuff like that. And they felt like there's some things that I did that they felt like was the worst thing in the world. And I will take ownership for saying that it wasn't the best parenting. Um, but I'm doing better. I've. I've been doing better for a long time now as far as parenting my kids better, not being so strict, so drill sergeant-ish. Um, because they needed love and not a um, commander. And I had to come to the realization that I couldn't just be the commander of my kids, but I needed to evoke love. Now, we do believe in discipline because in order to not create children that will feel like they can go out in the world and do whatever they want to and there are no consequences. Um, we had to continue to instruct and instill structure and discipline. So um, we made sure that they understood the consequences of the things they did. We just, I just, as I grew and learned better, I, um, I did better. And I did things differently. Now my older two that I gave birth to, um, Felt like I was soft on the last one that I gave birth to. Um, even my my girl that was home, um, my blended daughter, she did. She felt like everybody, all of them, felt like the baby didn't get what we got. And um, I I I apologize for it, but I'm not gonna sit here and be beat myself up for the things that I did. But I know that I'm forgiving myself. Um, and that's another chapter in the book. We'll get there in a second. But I know that I didn't make the best choices, but I learned to do better. So that's what I did as um, my little, my youngest one came into the picture. I did better. I became a, a somewhat softer parent. I was still hard because I wanted to make sure that they understood consequences. But I became somewhat more lenient, not fussing about everything, not getting on them about every move they make, not being so structured to where they were afraid to breathe type of thing. Um, my kids, they loved me. They did. Um, but I, I, I knew that what I was doing was creating the wrong type of environment for them. It was creating a similar environment to my own. And... Um, a lot of them struggle now emotionally because of some of the things that's happened in the past. So what I try to do right now in this space is be there for them as, as much as they allow me to be. Um, I can't give them everything in the world that they want, but I can be there for them and be that listening ear, be something for them that I don't get or I didn't get. Be that person they can go to and talk to about things that are going on or ask questions or if they have a dream about something and they want to get clarity on it. They have no hesitation with reaching out to me and calling me or if something's going wrong they got a question about abcd they have no hesitation with reaching out calling me i can't do that she's still here but i can't and never have been able to do that the things that i share with my mom she would tell everybody um so i stopped sharing so the things that my kids share with me we talk about it we you know i ask them if they i'm learning now as they become adults because, yeah, I got grown kids, y'all. As they become adults, I'm learning now to, instead of offering my opinion on things, I had to learn the hard way. I'm learning now to um, ask, do you want my advice on it? Or do you want my opinion on it? Or do you just need me to listen? And I do whatever it is they want me to do. They want me to listen, I listen. If they want my opinion and advice, I give it. Do they listen to it half the time? But I still get it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like the pain that my mom went through, we all experienced it. And then I started evoking that pain in my kids and had to come to realization to not let that be. Um, but as I came to that realization, I really started dealing with a lot. 
and then like the pain then i dealt with the pain of the losses that went around me so um i dealt with depression a lot like and sometimes it still creeps in trying to take over and wreak havoc in my brain but um i try not to let it hold on to me too much even this little spell that i've been gone now um, I dealt with some bouts of, of depression because I'm worrying about my mom and losing her um, and knowing. And then I had to have a little talk with Jesus, tell him all about my troubles. And um, he allowed me to go through the emotions that I needed to go through in order to prepare me mentally for in the event of and when she does leave this earth, that I can still be able to live life without her being physically here uh, mentally. I'm good emotionally. I'm okay. Um, but to where I can live life and be okay without her being physically in my presence. Um, but depression took place. So that's when I um, seeked help. During these times now, though, um, I've learned coping mechanisms and skills. Some of it was the bad stuff. And actually, I was telling y'all before when, you know, I get depressed, I eat. Uh, so that's why I'm in my fast right now. But, um, some of it was the other coping mechanism of finding things that brought me joy. Because I tell people all the time, it's like, you can't expect somebody to make you happy if you're not happy yourself. So I had to find how to make myself happy before I can expect anyone else in this world to make me happy. And that was the first thing I had to do is find a way to ensure that I brought my happiness back. My husband couldn't do it. My kids couldn't do it. You know, my brothers, none of it, my friends, not, nobody. Nobody could make me happy. I had to be able to go through the emotions and realize if I needed to go get therapy or counseling or if I needed to use the coping mechanisms and the skills that I've learned from previous sessions to help me to overcome the bouts of depression that I went through. Um, your mind plays tricks on you. The enemy will get in there and will make you think you are nothing. Will make you feel like your life is falling apart and you can't do nothing about it. It'd be like, nah, 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 I got you. So what you do is, what you do is you put on that full armor, you get God on your side and you break through that and you tell the enemy, now what? You go, what? Now what, son? You know what I'm saying? This, this is what you do. You, you fight back. You fight back with what you need um, and you help yourself through those difficult times. You don't allow the enemy to win and be victorious and to tear you apart and to, and to, and to rip you to shreds. You, you overcome depression. You don't sit here and say, I'm depressed. You can say, I'm dealing with depression. Because once you say that I am, you are putting that on you and you are making yourself become that. You know what I'm saying? Versus saying it's something you're dealing with. Because when you deal with something, you can be able to overcome it and come out of it. But if you say that you are that, you are making it believe within yourself that that's the person you are and that's who you become. So we work through it to make sure that we understand it. So look, there's a little poem in here um, from the book. Um, yeah, I'll give you out that one. Um, that talks about depression. And I wrote this one as well. And let's see, I wrote it and I use the words depressed, but I want to tell you what people who are depressed go through and what they feel like and what's going on. Because a lot of times people around them don't understand what they're dealing with. They don't understand what they're going through. And some of them say snap out of it. Like a lot of times the people around me don't understand like, well, why are you say, well, what are you going through? What's, what's... And the only answer you have is I don't know. It's just I'm feeling this way right now. And I ask that you give me time to, re to be able to um, acknowledge these feelings and be able to come up out of it. Don't force me out of it because it's not going to work. It's only going to pull me further down. Allow me time to get through it, heal, recover, become who I need to become through it, and keep moving. And I'll be okay in time. Just keep watch over me and be there with me and support me through this transition but don't pressure me. I'm okay. I'm gonna be okay. So the the press poem was written like this. Well, it's like a a play on words. So it says the press dealing with emptiness that people really don't understand. Everyone thinks you're just shy, and they don't think you like to smile. 
but you're actually enduring a lot of pain on the inside that you can't explain, you're depressed. So going through that is never easy for anybody. Um, but it's about, like I said, knowing when you need help, knowing when, um, when to, how to acknowledge the feelings because I'm not no expert in depression. I'm not no expert. I'm not a doctor. I'm not, you know, anything like that, but I t I'm talking about my experiences of dealing with it and what's helped me. Um, but having someone to talk to that can allow you to just talk about what's on you and be able to release the things that you're dealing with helps with the recovery process when it comes to depression. So I definitely say to surround yourself with people um, who are positive people, who are um, helping you to get through it and not tearing you down as you go through it. Um, you want those people around you that are going to be um, um, encouragers and not discouragers. So you need encouragers and not discouragers. Those are the people you want around you. So um, that's 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 that section. So we got me introducing myself to y'all, talking about the purposes of our pain and understanding that everything we go through is for a reason, is to help build us up and make us into the people that we are. Um, helping understand that grief happens to us, but we don't want to lose ourselves in it, but how it affects us is crazy. And it can have long-term effects if we don't find a way to um, heal from it. Um, and then understanding pain and the things that we go through and the sufferings that come along with it um, and how to be able to heal from it because otherwise we'll continue leaving, living life, dealing with those pains and taking them into relationships, friendships, into our work life, into just everywhere, every part of our life. And when we do that, that causes us to, um, to not be able to live the life the fulfilled life that we want to live because we're still living through pain and we're living through trauma and we got to release trauma and pain in order to live life to the fullest so that's the focus of that um the next section we'll talk about is going to be suffering um and a lot of us we suffer in silence and unfortunately they think that we're um we're okay and we're not okay but because we decide to not talk about what's going on or afraid to talk about what's going on, we have to continue to deal with it in silence and you don't have to. Um, you don't have to. Um, I would say to my kids a lot of times, closed mouths don't get fed. <clears throat> and that analogy goes a, goes a long way. Um, and when, what I mean by it when I tell my kids, it's like if they're wanting help with something, and they don't ask for the help, how does anyone know they need the help and how do they get the help? Um, or if they want something and they feel like, oh, if I ask Ma, she's gonna say no, but if you never open your mouth and ask me, how do you know if I'm gonna say no or yes? Um, but that analogy also works in um, a lot of situations, especially when you're dealing with someone that may um, be um, abusing you. If you don't speak up about it, no matter if you're fearful or not, then the fed part is you'll continue to deal with that and never be able to escape it because you never say anything. 